Hey guys, so I'm Sussex Sarah and I'm delighted to be here with uh, Cotswold Outdoor and Van Gogh um, for this amazing... Just want to check that everyone can hear me okay because it just cut out on my, uh, on my signal briefly there so just give me a, a little heart or a thumbs up to let me know if the audio is coming through alright um, and I'll get started. So for those of you who don't know who I am I'm Sussex Sarah, I'm a wildlife photographer and conservationist, um, so what I really love to do when I'm camping is get out in nature as responsibly as I can and get really close to some of our amazing British wildlife. Uh, for me, finding those really rare and, um, and really unique species that we have in the British Isles is such an incredible experience. So I'll be talking to you about that a little bit today. And I know that some of you are taking part in the Camping Masterclass from home this weekend. So I'll also be talking about an activity that you can do this evening to try and find out what wildlife is living in your garden. Um, before I start, I should probably mention that I've borrowed my parents' garden for the day now that we're allowed to uh, have socially distanced visits outside. Um, and it seems like everyone's done exactly the same thing as me and got outside today. So I do apologise for any background noise um, and do shout if you're finding it hard to hear me and I'll try and move my setup around a little bit. Um, so camping, as I said, gets me closer to wildlife. Some of the places that I desperately love to visit and can't wait to get to uh, once lockdown lifts and we can go back outside and, and start really camping out in nature again are places like Simmons Yat in the Forest of Dean, where you find amazing wildlife like wild boars, um, deer, dippers, uh, they've got some amazing peregrines that nest on the crags up there, um, broads where you've got that open wide expanse, you can find amazing wildlife wherever you go. Um, and I know that Veggie Vagabonds yesterday were doing an amazing talk on sustainability um, in the outdoors as well and kind of really highlighting the fact that you can go camping anywhere um, and have a really amazing experience so do look for campsites off the beaten track do try and find places that perhaps aren't as heavily visited particularly as we know this summer is going to be really busy and you can find some incredible experiences wherever you choose to spend your time so I'll be talking a little bit today about some of the places that you can go and answering some of your questions on what you might see but I'll also be talking about how you can make sure that you're not having a negative impact on the wildlife that you're watching too. Um, we all know that, that wildlife is sensitive and we all want to do our best to protect it. So I think, I think that's really important. So camping at home. Uh, give me a wave if you're camping at home this weekend. I know Cotswold Outdoor have got an amazing, and, and Van Gogh have got an amazing competition running um, for lots of you this weekend. Um, so I think I'm expecting loads of people to be sending in pictures of their, their home setups. Um, as I said, I'm in my parents' back garden today, so I'm not going to be camping here because there's still no overnight trips allowed. Um, but I will be showing you just how to, to try and find some of that wildlife in your garden. And my parents' garden, so this is the garden that I grew up in, um, is such an amazing home for wildlife. Like I've come out here of an evening before and I've seen foxes playing in the early summer sun. Um, I, I saw a slow worm, which is actually a legless lizard. Um, down by the pond that I built at the end of their garden when I got here this afternoon. It's a little bit cold for it now, otherwise I would have tried to show you. Um, and the frog spawn and the tadpoles are absolutely heaving in our garden pond. Um, so even if you're doing your event at home this evening, um, it's well worth getting out into your back gardens for a little bit, having a look around and seeing what you can find. And even if you're in urban environments, um, some of the, the best kind of peregrine spots that I've ever seen have been in urban locations. Um, so do just pick up um, your camera or your binoculars if you have them and have a look outside and see what you can see because you might be amazed at the amount of wildlife that's around you. So basic wildlife watching tools, you've got your binoculars. Now I don't use my binoculars an awful lot and these are probably the item that I would uh, leave out of my kit if I was looking to go for a heavy, heavy camping hiking experience. Um, I tend to stick to my camera. Um, if you've got a good camera with a zoom lens, I'd highly recommend using the zoom lens instead of your binoculars when you're out in as much distance and as much information with the zoom on this as I can with my binoculars, so it does help make your kit a little bit lighter. Um, I have a camera that I choose because it's got such an amazing zoom on it, it means I can take 
brilliant wildlife photos without having to get close at all, without putting nature under any pressure and without disturbing things. And then I'm also aware that there's probably some people in the room who are fairly new to nature um, or just getting into nature. There's been such a, a revival of people wanting to get outside and wanting to connect to nature during lockdown. Um, so if you haven't already, I would suggest buying a, a nature spotting book as well. Um, or what I used to do when I was first starting to learn about species was I'd take photos in the field and then spend a good couple of hours at home trying to identify exactly what I'd seen. So I'd photograph something even if I didn't know what it was and then spend that time at home trying to ID it rather than wasting a lot of time in the field trying to work out exactly what I'd seen. So, I think it's probably about time that we started on the task. It looks like a fair few people have joined us. So I'm just gonna try and move my camera kit around. Um, bear with me, because this might be a little bit tricky, but I need you to see exactly what I've got going on. Oh. <laughs> exactly what I've got going on below me because I have got a table set up why is this not working there we go I've got a table set up um, and I'll be showing you how to make a paw print tracker I'm doing this in the most awkward way possible aren't I guys right I hope you can yeah really don't like technology in the field Let's see if I can do this another way. Right. As you can tell, I don't use a tripod very often when I'm in the field. Um, I tend to do a lot of my work free health, hand health. Um, but today, to show you how to make this paw print tracker, I wanted to make sure you could clearly see exactly what I was doing. So hopefully, those of you wanting to take part along live have had a look at the instructions, worked out what kit you need. But for anyone who's wanting to watch the video back later, this is exactly what we're going with. So, bottle of water, sustainable bottle, if you have one. Um, if not, I highly recommend purchasing one. Um, the Cotswold Outdoor online shop has loads of this kit as well. Um, so do go and have a look if you are lacking. Um, a baking tray, which most of us have at home anyway. Um, you want to make sure it's a shallow baking tray. So as you can see, this one's very shallow and very wide, and that will be important. A small shallow dish. Now I've gone for as small as I can possibly go, um, because I want to make sure that I've got as much space around the edge of this baking tray as possible. Now my instructions said a ruler. Don't have a ruler. So I found a bit of wood that was knocking around my house. And then the main ingredient is sand. Now you can do this with mud, but sand is a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to demonstrate. But if I was doing this at home and leaving it out myself, I would probably be using mud because I think it tends to work a little bit better and you get a little bit more clarity in the footprints that you might find. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna spread the sand across the tray nice and evenly pushing that out into all the corners and so i don't know if you've ever been walking down an estuary or down the beach and spotted those prints that you see in the tight like in the sand and the mud um, and wondered what they are but this is what we're going to be doing in your back gardens so as i said before my parents have got foxes in their gardens in their garden but i'm fairly sure that where they live at the foot of the south downs in eastbourne it's very likely that there's going to be things like badgers around too. Um, I've only seen one hedgehog in the last 10 years around this area, but it was at the end of this road. Uh, so you might even be really lucky and find something like a hedgehog. Um, but I know there's loads of small mammals in this garden as well. So I'm sat right next to their shed at the moment and I've had um, wood mice in that shed in the past as well. And I don't think people realise there's quite a few small mammals that do live in around our gardens and our, um, our outdoor spaces. So there's not just mice, there's things like bank rolls um, and shrews as well. So what we're going to do today is set this up and then what you'd do at home is you'd leave it out overnight, try and find a quiet area. So the ideal place is kind of an access point. So my parents have got like a gap under their gate, which is ideal for things like hedgehogs and foxes to squeeze through. 
you want to place this in somewhere where you think might get some through traffic um, so now you've spread your sand and flattened it out we're just going to add a little bit of water now what this does oh I'm making a mess what this does if you smooth it out is it gives you a bit more of a, a damp sand surface so it makes it easier for the paw prints to come through and you'll need to kind of judge this a little bit so you don't want to make it too wet because otherwise you won't get any prints staying and you don't want to make it too dry otherwise you won't be able to see what's what's been walking over it so I think that feels about wet enough. So yeah, I don't know if you can see there, I'll hold it up a little bit, but you can start to see some indents there. Um, so if I, if I do it with this actually, then you can, yeah, you can start to see the indents that have been made. So once you've got it to about the right consistency, you just want to smooth it over and make it as even as possible. And I'm, I'm kind of doing this quite quickly, but at home you might want to have a play around with this a little bit more. So you might find that it's worth keeping some sand back and trying it once. And if you make it a little bit too wet, then you can um, just switch the sand out and start over. And then you'll have a better idea of just how wet or damp it needs to be. So smooth it all out. You pop your jar in the middle. And because I'm not staying here tonight and I'm trying to be as sustainable as possible, I'm not putting any food in this one because I don't want to be wasteful. But what I'd suggest that you use is something like a, a low sodium dog food or you might want to use some leftover chicken that you've had for dinner. Um, but just avoid anything with too high a salt content. And then what you do is you just leave that in the place that I said, so somewhere where, where you're likely to get lots of through traffic. Um, and then in the morning you can check what mammals might have walked over and so they'll walk over they'll go to the dish hopefully they'll eat the food and then you'll be able to see their prints on the way in and the way out and then what do you do once you've got your prints well i'm not going to be around in the morning but if you do want to send your photos in to us then please do tag them with um camping masterclass and you can go on to things like the rspb website or the wildlife trust website and download a paw print id chart so this has got some of the species that you'd be likely to find in your garden. So you've got a wood mouse here. You've got badger ones. Badger prints are amazing. Badger prints here. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have an otter in your garden, I would love to see photos of that. But yeah, so you can, you can find out what you've got. And some of them are more common than others. I would say most people, even in urban areas, might have a good chance of getting a fox. Um, if you've got trees in your garden, you might, you might find that you get squirrels. And there's some other simple tips that I can give you as well to help encourage wildlife in your garden. So I mentioned that my parents have got a gap under their gate and that's a really important feature. So what we found is that gardens have become quite enclosed spaces and there's not much space for wildlife to move around. So if you cut a small hole, either in a hedge with your neighbour's permission or in the bottom of a fence, again with your neighbour's permission, then you can join your gardens up and make an incredible wildlife corridor. And then you'll find that you'll get more and more of these small mammals um, and more of this wildlife using your outdoor space. Is there any questions? I'm just going to reset up my setup here so that I can see your, uh, your questions. Are there any questions about that tracker? Because I know I went through that fairly quickly and I just want to make sure that you've got all the information that you need to be able to do that at home. Are we all good? okay um so yeah so moving on to the other ways to encourage garden wildlife and um, you can see that i've got some bird feeders up behind me now i've moved these today and bird feeders do take quite a while for birds to get used to them so i'm not expecting an awful lot of action on this feeder but where i am in sussex you can already hear that there's things like herring gulls moving about in fact i can see one on the roof just opposite i think it's eyeing up my sand tray um, I've had a wren singing just behind me and a blackbird um, and one of the other questions that the Cotswold Outdoor team sent across to me that you guys have asked about is how you can learn some of these sounds. Um, now I, I find that I don't learn birdsong in quite the same way as most people do. I can't tell you 
why I know that a sedge warbler is a sedge warbler and not a reed warbler, and those are quite hard to distinguish. Um, but there is some real method to it. So what you can do is you can either download um, a couple of apps that you can find on the App Store that will record the sound and give you a rough idea of what that bird might be. Um, or you can use a free online resource called Xeno Canto um, and that will allow you to play bird song back so that you can try and identify what you've heard in the field. Um, or you can go and give my friend Lucy Lapwing a follow because she's doing these amazing bird song tutorials. Uh, so if anyone wants to learn kind of from the basics upwards, I really would recommend checking out her feed. What's my favourite gar uh, garden wildlife animal? Do you know, I'd have to say a hedgehog. Like, so the, the hedgehog that I saw down my parents' road, as I said, it was the first one that I'd seen in a good 10 years. Um, and, and while I absolutely adore foxes, to me, they're, wild, they're like countryside animals. I see them quite a lot in the countryside, which I know is probably quite a, a lucky and rare experience um, because most people associate them with urban habitats these days. But a hedgehog, they're in such sharp declines and seeing one is so special. Um, when we start getting out into the wider countryside, lots of us want to think about how we can get close to nature um, away from our doorsteps. So once the restrictions ease and once we can get out a little bit wider, um, then there's a few tips that, you, that I can give you that will help you get close to, to wildlife. But the key thing to remember is that when you're traveling in nature, you're walking into nature's home particularly at this time of year it's breeding season at the moment um so uh, lots of animals are, are really scared and really really alert they're looking after their nests they're looking after their babies so if you come across a breeding bird enjoy it but back away and make sure it's got space and it's comfortable um, and the easiest way to tell if a bird is scared or alarmed is if they're calling out if they're behaving unusually um then then do back away um because you may not realize it but almost half of england's most threatened breeding birds nest on the ground so if you if you're seeing birds displaying that kind of alarm behavior and if you're seeing other mammals displaying that alarm behavior then the chances are you're too close to a nest um so yeah please just act responsibly and then you can make sure that that nature's there for the next person to discover as well where can I see wild peregrine falcons? So as I mentioned at the beginning, I think for me, one of the best places to have an amazing visual experience and an amazing wildlife experience is Dawn at Simmons Yacht. Um, so that's on the border of England and Wales. It's an amazing place. There's loads of campsites around there as well. I went camping there for my birthday in September last year. And at dawn, the mist rises over the river and then you get this amazing mix of tawny owls still calling at the end of the night and peregrine falcons calling out at the beginning of the morning. And then you've got the deer and the wild boar and it is just, it's a magical experience. And I deliberately got up at the crack of dawn so that I could be at that Simmons Yap viewpoint to see those, those peregrines and feel that experience. Um, how can you get close to wildlife without disturbing it? So there's a couple of tips and tricks that I would say we can do as humans to make us less threatening to wildlife. Um, one of them is move very quietly. Um, so I don't know if you've seen the photos of the promo for this event, but I'm wearing the sorrel boots that I got from Cotswold Outdoor. And actually they're incredibly light on your feet. So they make virtually no noise when I'm walking around the countryside and I can't recommend that enough. Get footwear that doesn't make an awful lot of noise. My basic rule of thumb is if you can hear yourself walking, then the wildlife can hear you. Their ears are so much sharper than ours are. Um, so anything you can do to reduce the noise is a really key thing. I tend to avoid wearing waterproof trousers um, and waterproof jackets when I'm out in the field because that rustling is, again, a noise that I can hear. And if, for me, when I'm working, getting closer to wildlife is the most important thing. If that means me getting a bit wet and damp, then I'll have to just suck it up and take that. Um, I'll just make sure that I've got somewhere to dry off afterwards. What can we do to enjoy wildlife responsibly with our dogs? Great question. So, I mean, everyone wants to get out in the countryside with their dogs and who wouldn't? 
I don't have a dog because I live in a flat and it wouldn't be fair for me. Um, but I would love to own one. And what I would do to make sure that my dog was acting responsibly about wildlife is just keep it on a lead, keep it under close control. There are so many places that you can let dogs off leads in urban areas um, and in dedicated off lead parks. I would take my animal there to let it off the lead rather than let it run in the wider countryside. Because not only is there a risk to wildlife when your dog's running off leads in things like woodlands, heathlands and on beaches, but there's also actually a risk to your dog. Um, I think, generally speaking, I'd keep my dog on a lead um, unless it was in one of those dedicated off-lead areas. Um, lost my train of thought slightly there. Oh, wider wildlife. So, yeah, talking about how you can get close to wildlife without scaring it off. So we've done noise. What I also tend to do is make sure that I'm... So I'm walking quietly, but I'm walking slowly. You'd be amazed at how much more wildlife you see when you take the time to walk slowly and scan everything around you. So I, I make a point now of going out and doing my wildlife photography alone. As much as I would love to have a group of friends with me, I can see so much more and so many different species when I'm out in the countryside by myself than I can when I'm having a natter with my best friend while we walk. Um, there are some times that I'll do that like when we're allowed um but if i'm doing that then it tends to be when i'm watching something like an owl or a bird of prey and we're sat in a car if i'm out just walking in the general countryside and my aim is to see wildlife then i keep as quiet as possible um and i move as slowly as possible um so for example yesterday i moved a bit too quickly i was down at one of my favorite places um a reserve called rye harbour on the sussex coast and I'd been watching this, this white-fronted goose, which was really late, so I was really excited by this goose, and then turned around and walked straight up the trail that I'd started to walk up uh, to see a stoat that I'm fairly sure had been playing in the wood pile behind me while I was watching this goose for 10 minutes dart across the road. And if I'd taken a little bit more time and care, then I'd have probably been able to get some amazing shots of that stoat. Um, so yeah, really slow it down, really think about what it is you're wanting to see. The next tip that I would give you is talk to locals. Um, you would be amazed how many people I stop and talk to in the countryside. And it's never a bad experience. Like you will always find some nugget of information that you didn't realize that you, you might need. Um, so for example, when I, again, Forest of Dean, dippers are a species that I don't get in Sussex. They're a species that I always want to see if I can when I'm in dipper habitat. Um, and I got a tip off from a guy and within kind of five minutes of settling myself down in an area then this dipper showed up and it was stunning and I've never been as close to, to a bird like that as I was in this area. So it's always worth checking in. Um, I'm really excited about my, my upcoming holiday to the Norfolk Broads uh, at the end of summer because I'm hoping that thanks to the tip off from the, the guy whose cabin we rented, I'm hoping that I'll be able to see the otters that are down there as well and that'll be a lifetime ambition come true so anything we can do to protect wildlife in urban areas yep same principles apply i would say stick to the countryside code avoid uh, leaving litter i mean we've seen some horrible photos of the amount of litter that's been left from people enjoying the outside this weekend so please take your litter home with you it can be dreadfully dangerous for wildlife um, and nobody wants that and nobody thinks about that impact when they're they're leaving things behind so just yeah take some time take a litter bag with you um and in urban areas i would say it's probably one of those those times where if you see something particularly unusual just just take a minute and think twice before you put that on social media particularly during breeding season so this is one of the things that i talk about quite a lot on my own feed is we're in such an information sharing society these days and we all want to get this fantastic news out but sometimes if you find something like a badger set or a fox's den and you're in a really heavily um, visited area then sharing that information can quickly spread and you, you can put that animal under so much more pressure because everyone wants to see it so i think um yeah just think just think twice about sharing things that are, are mega rare sightings Okay, so going back to the wider wildlife, 
I would say, and I'm fairly sure that Cotswold and Van Gogh, Cotswold Outdoor and Van Gogh would also say camping and going out and enjoying wildlife is a year round event. It's not just for the summer, um, although I know it's obviously a lot easier to camp in the summer. It's just a bit warmer and it's far more comfortable. But you will find that at different seasons there is different wildlife that you can get close to as well. Um, so in my area of Sussex, I don't get kingfishers particularly all year round. But I do find that they show really well in the winter periods because they all move down towards the coast where it's a little bit warmer. Um, so one thing that I did want to show you guys today, which I'm really excited about, which has definitely helped me cut down how much I move around while I'm out in the field, is this amazing heat map from Van Gogh, which I picked up a couple of weeks ago and it packs down really small but you plug it into a USB cable uh, into a power bank and then switch that on and then just press the button in the corner and that will heat up so I was so excited to find this because I was talking about kingfishers just a second ago and I spent so many hours in the freezing cold waiting for kingfishers to show up on my patch they tend to favour a favourite perch so if you're looking for them and um, sometimes it's a really long wait and this camping heat mat is so amazing because you can just wrap it around you you don't have to use it in a tent and it means you can sit sit warmer for longer um, and really increase your chances of seeing some of that wildlife um, again watching wildlife is a waiting game so i really would say don't get disheartened if you don't see things on your first attempt um, if you're desperate to see some of the rarer wildlife and you really, really kind of want to find a way to make that work but want to make sure that you're not putting pressure on wildlife, then do check out some of the, the campsites around wildlife experiences as well. You might find that, for example, when I was a kid in the New Forest, we went, we went camping and they had a, a badger tour that you could go on in the evening. And again, it's another way those tour guides are trained on how to reduce pressure on the animals, um, how to make sure that those sites stay secret. So it's really worth putting in some research before you go out. Oh, the sun's coming out now and it's shining right in my eyes. Um, it's really worth putting in the research before you go camping, before you pick your campsite. If your main focus is finding wildlife, then, then see if there's a way that you can do it and guarantee yourself a sighting. As I say, for things like badgers, kingfishers, red squirrels, um, otters, I don't know about wild boar, but deer. There's, there's often things like deer, safaris that you can go on where you can be driven around as well. Um, and going on those kind of guided tour trips, they might add a little bit extra to your budget, but they also increase your chances of seeing those animals in a really secure and sustainable way without putting additional pressure on the wildlife. Have we got any other questions coming through before I need to move on to the next part? just want to scroll back and see if there's anything I've missed. Okie doke. Um, so one other, other thing that I would like to talk about is campfires. Um, Campfires are amazing and they're an integral part of the camping experience when we're going out in nature. A lot of us really, I think I've perched myself too close to the bottom here, a lot of us really want to have that camp, campfire experience. But to protect wildlife, there are some really um, sensitive areas where campfires just aren't sensible. Um, so please check with your local national parks um, and your local... Um, county rules as to what the rules are around campfires in certain habitats so for example I live on the South Downs um, and I think there's a blanket ban on having any sort of campfire or barbecue on the South Downs because Chalk Downland is a really fragile habitat um, and we've also got lowland heathland fragments as well which are really sensitive to fire and fire risk is one of the biggest threats to to wildlife in the summer months um, particularly in those kind of high risk fire areas uh, so what I would recommend is if you're looking to go camping and looking to get closer to wildlife is making sure that you pack something like a camping stove so that you don't have to have a, a wildfire, not a wildfire, 
definitely don't want to have a wildfire so you don't have to have a campfire you can cook um securely and safely in your in your tent without causing any risk to wildlife so that brings me on to the rest of the countryside code i think i've mentioned some of this before but um but leave no trace um, and, and make sure that you're not disturbing wildlife when you're photographing it. I've posted up on my Instagram today a couple of sites that I would highly recommend going to when you're wanting to see certain species as well. So if you want to go and have a look at that after the talk, then please do. Um, but if you've got any more questions about where to see certain species, then do ping them through now. I'm just going to pull out my list of questions that I'd already been sent in by some of you guys so that I can make sure I answer as many of those as possible. Just want to keep an eye on the time as well um, to make sure that I'm not going over. So the only question that I haven't answered yet is what's the best environment to see birds? So this brings us back to those sensitive habitat questions. You will get two different types of wildlife, really. You'll get what's known as a habitat specialist and what's known as a generalist. So it depends on what you want to see. If you want to see something like a nightingale or a turtle dove, which are two of my favourite birds in summer, um, then I would say you need to be looking for the right habitat if you want to increase your chances of seeing those birds. So for nightingale and turtle dove, you want really scrubby areas in the southeast of England where they're regularly heard or seen. Um, but if you're looking for things like deer, um, depending on the deer species, then you, you want to be picking your locations based on that as well. So, I mean, I've, I've spotted amazing Chinese water deer when I've been up in Norfolk uh, at an RSPB reserve. And then red deer, um, I would go to somewhere like Cumbria, perhaps, or even Richmond Park, actually, I think have a really good herd of red deer. Um, but again, keep your distance, make sure that if you can, speak to the locals, try and get a little bit of um, info on where they're likely to be feeding at certain times of day. Some of these animals can be really habitual as well. So you'll find that if you turn up in the right place at the right time of day, you've got a far higher chance of seeing them. Um, lots of wildlife is easier to see first thing in the morning or last thing at night um, in that kind of switchover period. So I tend to go out as early as I can for for things like birds singing if I, if I want to photograph birds and if I want to photograph um, some of those kind of crepuscular species like stoats and weasels and hares then early in the morning is a really good time to see those and those twilight hours particularly in summer when the nights are shorter the twilight hours are amazing for starting to kind of think find things like owls coming out or badgers or foxes um, so it is really worth doing a little bit of reading and um, doing a little bit of research before you choose your camping destination and before you try and find set out to find that wildlife that you want to find um, but do feel free to ping me any questions after if you want if you didn't want to ask a question in the talk and just want a little bit more information one-to-one -one, then yeah just do give me a follow and ping me a message on sussex underscore sarah uh, what habitats to add is like so adders are another kind of fairly specialist species. I'd say they predominantly live in heathland areas. Um, so I'm lucky that I get them on the South Downs. I've got a friend who's a really amazing photographer who's got them on the North Yorkshire moors. Um, anywhere in the uplands, you're likely to find adders, but also around sand dunes. So uh, the Corn Cornish coast is pretty amazing for them. And I think Dorset gets a good number of adders as well. Um, if you see a snake in your garden, so I mentioned slow worms earlier, um, that's actually a legless lizard, not a snake. But if you see a snake in your garden, it's more likely to be a slow worm, not a snake, or a grass snake. Um, so don't panic if you find a snake in your garden. It's not necessarily a poisonous adder. Um, and adders very rarely bite as well. So just make sure you're giving them space and, and letting them bask in the sun and they'll leave you well alone. Um, but it is another reason that I suggest that you keep dogs on leads uh, because adders uh, dogs feet are lighter than ours um, and dogs are far more likely to be bitten than we are um i think that's pretty much all i have time for today if there's no other oh the only other thing that i was going to say is 
Um, if you're going out in unfamiliar areas, uh, particularly wildlife watching, and if you're anything like me, I am really bad for not taking a map and not following the main paths or trails and just exploring and following the wildlife that I find. Um, so please make sure if you're going out in unfamiliar areas, particularly after dark, that you make a mental note of your route home or you write it down or you use something like this Fitbit which has got GPS coordinates on it to get you back to your campsite safely as well uh, because that, that summer evening light it does fall really quickly, it does get dark really quickly and if you're caught up in something like watching young badger cubs playing outside a set it can be so easy to lose track of time um, and it can be quite dangerous to get yourself lost in forest areas or places like that if you if you haven't kind of already planned out your route home. So I really would would recommend making sure that you've got a, a safe strategy for getting yourself back to your campsite and getting yourself home safely too. If there's no more questions, then I think I'll probably wrap up there. But it's been absolutely amazing to talk to you guys and um, thank you so much for having me on and thank you so much to Cotswold Outdoor and Van Gogh for putting on this event and um, I hope you've enjoyed the entire session I've definitely been watching some of the other speakers and finding out the really inform interesting information that they've had to share there's a whole other day of talks tomorrow so please do make sure that you're logging on and watching and getting involved with everyone's events Take care and I look forward to seeing your pictures of your paw print trackers. So do tag us with Camping Masterclass um, if you manage to get any amazing prints. See you later guys.